Hello and welcome to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Patrick Reyes, and on today's show, we have Associate Professor Graham Hall, who's from the Curtin School of Physiotherapy and Exercise Science. He is also an expert in lung health, and he is also the Deputy Director of the Telethon Kids Institute. And he's joined us today to talk about, well, lung health, since it is Lung Health Awareness Month, where we talk about the importance of breathing and encourage everyone to stop and think about what they can do with just one breath. Welcome to the show, Graham. Thanks, Patrick. And it's, um, I'm glad to be here. Yeah. All right. So um, uh, for our first question, why are premature children more likely to have asthma or asthma-like symptoms? Yeah, Patrick, so we know that uh, in Australia today and globally, approximately 10% of births are born premature. So that is the the babies are born at less than 37 weeks um, gestational age out of a normal 40 weeks term birth. Now, for many of these children, um, they go on not to have many lung problems. However, for those who are born very preterm, that's less than 32 weeks gestational age, um, a lot of their lung development happens um, outside of their mother's womb. And so this means that instead of the airways uh, and the peripheral airways and the alveoli uh, developing as they would normally, they start to develop in an abnormal environment. This, this leads to the structure of the lung being quite different. Um, on top of that, if babies are born very preterm, often they need supplemental oxygen, um, they might have um, CPAP or mechanical ventilation in the neonatal intensive care unit. And while, of course, these are life-saving therapies, they can also cause um, some damage to the lungs. So what we found in some of our research is that up to 30 to 40% of 9 to 10-year-olds who were born very preterm, their parents and the children report Um, wheezing, cough, symptoms with exercise. So these are all of the symptoms that we see in asthmatic children. What we don't know for certain is whether the symptoms they're reporting are a result of asthma, i.e. that these children who were born preterm have developed asthma, or if there is some other underlying problem in their lungs. Um, Of course, they do, like all children, have the same risk of developing asthma, and maybe the risk is higher. Uh, So at this stage, we're not quite sure if it's asthma or not, but there is a much higher proportion of these children born preterm reporting symptoms, reporting medication, asthma medication use than we would expect in the general population. Now, as these children get older, is it possible for them to maybe grow out of asthma? These preterm children? Uh, So in the cohort that we've been following, we saw them, uh, some of them first when they were about five to six years of age, and then we saw them again at 10 to 11 years of age. And actually, we found that the symptoms uh, and their lung function got a little bit worse. Not in all children. Some of them did seem to, uh, their lungs grew normally and not different to term-born controls. But in some children, it got worse. Uh, So our concern is that there might be a subgroup of children born preterm whose lung function uh, and breathing problems may actually get uh, progress uh, and become worse over time. Uh, There isn't a lot of studies following these children over a long period of time into young adult life. Uh, The ones that are have do seem to suggest that while they may not catch up, they're not falling further behind. but as neonatal treatments have changed over time and as we're getting better at, at uh, resuscitating and, and um, premature babies are becoming even more preterm, um, we, we are, uh, really have moving goalposts here in terms of the, long, the long-term outcomes in terms of lung health for these preterm children. So it's something we need to focus on over the coming years. All right. Now, uh, can you tell us uh, what are some of the common triggers for asthma? Yeah, so as many of your listeners will know, there there are a range of triggers uh, that can cause individuals with asthma um, to um, develop respiratory symptoms, uh, and and some of these are, you know, the ones you would expect: um, cats, grasses, pollen, house dust mite, uh, and so for example, um, a lot of people would have read 
in the news in Melbourne recently, um, those tragic deaths as a result of um, thunderstorm asthma where you have these thunderstorms coming, coming through um, with rapid increases in grasses and pollens and, and other allergens. Um, and of course, if you have individuals who are uh, sensitive to those triggers and then and perhaps their um, adherence to taking preventive medications is not optimal, then then they are at increased risk of having problems. And, and unfortunately, we've seen that this, this week in Melbourne um, with, I think, now four deaths being reported. Um, the other triggers that, that can occur are just from common viruses. Uh, and so we know, particularly in children, up to 80% of asthma flare-ups are triggered by a virus. We don't know why some asthmatics are particularly influenced by viruses compared to others or, or even people in the general population, but it does seem to be one of those triggers that can really put people in trouble. Now, I've, I've never witnessed uh, for myself an asthma attack, but if sometime in the future I do, uh, what would be the best plan of action when someone is having an, atta an attack? Yeah, so it does vary from individual to individual, but the, the key is to try to get the airways open again. Um, and so, you know, I would encourage everybody to talk to their local asthma foundation if they do have asthma about asthma first aid. Um, and many of the asthma foundations across Australia run asthma first aid programs for both individuals with asthma, their families, but also they have programs for schools and workplaces. Um, generally, what we encourage is for people to take um, at least four puffs of um, a reliever medication, and that varies for different individuals, but one common one that people often recognize is Ventolin. Um, and if that doesn't work, to take, to take more. Um, and if that still doesn't work, then it's really important that they're calling emergency services um, because if, if their flare-up is not responding to you know, two or three doses of insulin in a very short period of time, then it's likely to continue to get worse and it's, and it's imperative that they um, contact emergency services, ambulance services or, or, um, or get to an emergency department of a hospital um, to get the treatment that they need. And um, can you explain in detail what an asthma action plan is and why it's important for all family members and schools? Yes, so um, Australia has quite a comprehensive system of asthma action plans. These are recommended by the um, Australian Asthma Management Handbook, which is um, uh, developed by the National Asthma Council in partnership with the federal government. Um, and health professionals and healthcare providers. Um, and it's a fantastic resource and uh, has a really usable online system. Um, so asthma action plans are really where um, individuals with asthma are working with their physicians, so usually their GPs in primary care. Um, and they sit down and they have a very clear plan and go through a conversation of, okay, well, what does your asthma look like? Um, what are your triggers? What medications should you be taking every day? And if, some, if you are triggered or if you do get a flare-up, how are you going to respond? So really, it puts, it puts people with asthma back in the driving seat. And so they have a very clear roadmap, if you like, of saying, okay, well, everything's going along. Um, I'm not having symptoms. And, and so I'm taking my preventers twice a day and I don't really need the Ventolin or, or similar very often. But then if something does happen, they have a very clear step and this is what I do next. And then if it continues to get worse, then there's a clear step of what they do after that. And if it continues to get worse, then it's call your doctor, call an ambulance, go to an emergency department. Um, so we know that, in, that if individuals who have an asthma action plan and who follow that asthma action plan, the outcomes for those individuals are very good. They have less unplanned, um, presentations to their doctors, less uh, emergency presentations and, and less asthma flare-ups. Unfortunately, in Australia, the number of people who have an action, asthma action plan um, is quite low. Uh, so, for example, 40% of children have an asthma action plan, um, but only 20% of adults do. So, interestingly, uh, 
parents are very good at having an asthma action plan for their children, or four out of ten parents. Uh, but when it's the parents themselves, only one out of five. Um, so I think there's a lot that we can do there, and it and can be something as simple as making an appointment with your GP and just going in and asking the question, can I talk to you about an asthma action plan? All right, and uh, in an article I've read, it does state that Australia has one of the highest asthma rates in the world. Now, uh, why is that? Yeah, so it's not entirely clear. So Australia, uh, the United States of America, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, Canada, um, all seem to have very high rates of asthma and, and higher, than, higher than you would expect. Um, some of this may be the way the immune system uh, grows and develops even before we're born. Obviously, our immune systems are, are, are not designed to respond to things like house dust mites or cat fur or grasses. It's there to respond to um, parasitic um, infections of the gut, you know, worms or, or you know, really important infectious diseases. And one of the theories, uh, which your viewers may be familiar with, um, sort of the term hygiene hypothesis, is that as developed countries have developed better public health, uh, everything's become cleaner, we have vaccinations and all of this, that our, our environment now has become so clean that our immune system is now starting to respond to things that it would never have responded to before. Um, it's very difficult to prove that this is true, uh, so it remains a hypothesis only, um, but this is likely to be one of the things because what we do see is in, country, in developing countries, as they move uh, to having better public health, better access to clean water, all of those things that moving along um, a development pathway include, uh, while they get less infectious disease, they do start to have more asthma symptoms. Um, but we don't know for sure just yet. All right. And uh, for our final question, what is next for asthma research? Well, I think, you know, that's probably a, a two-pronged question. Clearly, the, the ultimate goal is, clearly the ultimate goal is to cure asthma. Mm -hmm. um, however, I think we're a lot, uh, many years away from that. And even if we were to uh, prevent asthma in every newborn baby uh, from today, we would still have um, over 2 million Australians who have asthma. Uh, so, you know, the key focus, I think, for all health professionals is to help people with asthma, control their asthma, um, and to take control of their asthma so that they can prevent asthma flare-ups, so that we can prevent uh, tragic preventable deaths like we've seen this week in, in Melbourne and like we see every, every year. Um, and so really having finding ways to make it easier for people to um, be able to take the medications that we've got, to make sure that the people who need to have those treatments are getting them, um, and to work really closely with individuals with asthma and the doctors who are looking after them and other healthcare, healthcare professionals looking after them to have the best plans that suits an individual so that it's easy for them to um, stay compliant to that asthma action plan. All right, well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Graham. Thank you. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. Again, I'm your host, Patrick Reyes, and we've been in conversation with Graham Hall as we talked about lung health in relation to Lung Health Awareness Month. If you've missed our conversation or if you'd like to listen to this interview again, transcripts and audio of this program are available at healthprofessionalradio.com.au and also at hpr.fm, and you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes.